Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Lenatra, State Representative of the 12th Plymouth District, representing the towns of Kingston, Plimpton, Halifax, parts of Plymouth, a part of Duxbury, and a part of Middleborough. Thank you for joining me for the first episode of Profiles with Kathy Lenatra. Our district is such a unique and diverse place, filled with interesting and inspiring residents working behind the scenes to support their neighbors and community. We are blessed with dynamic programs, events, and services that enrich our lives. I wanted to take time each month to highlight the unsung people, programs, and events that make this district so special. I hope you enjoy these stories and are inspired by them. In our first episode, I'm going to introduce you to two people who were instrumental in establishing and operating what became the only vaccine clinic in the 12th Plymouth District for many months. The vaccination clinic at the Skin Esteem Med Spa in Kingston began operating in February of this year and has offered hundreds of vaccines to people all over the South Shore. They were a lifeline to so many people, many of whom were seniors in the area and couldn't get to one of the larger regional sites for a vaccine. My first guest is Dawn Naylor. Dawn is the owner and medical director of the Skin Esteem Med Spa in Kingston. She received her Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy from LaSalle College and went on to receive her RN, her MSN, and Acute Care Nurse Practitioner License at Mass General Hospital's Institute of Health Professionals. Welcome, Dawn. It's so great to have you on. Thank you, Kathy, for having me. Oh, it's so good to see you. I've, a lot of people don't know about you, Dawn, so could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what prompted you to open the Skin Esteem Med Spa in Kingston? Sure. Um, you already introduced me as far as my credentials. Um, I am going to be 50 in one week and went back at 49 years old to get my doctorate in nursing. Um, one of the things that's really important to me is community health. As a uh, nurse practitioner, I have been trained as an intensivist and I've worked in the emergency room and the ICU for 20 years, along with doing aesthetic medicine. And um, during the first COVID pandemic um, surge, I wound up seeing a lot of people, unfortunately, um, pass from COVID and, and it inspired me with the idea to open the vaccine clinics. Um, I actually opened the med spa because um, I really wanted to have a place where people can come to get treatments to look more youthful and feel better about themselves, which boosts their, their self-esteem. And that's where I came up with the name Skin Esteem. So um, with all my history of working in the ICU, um, it prompted me to sort of uh, do aesthetic medicine and do some kind of community um, projects like the one I did recently. Wow, I love the name Skin Esteem. And I wondered how you came up with that name. So can you just explain what was the process like? Because there were so many people that weren't able to get vaccines and it, how did you actually be able to get the vaccines to give out to the community? One of my colleagues, Dr. Justin Holtzman had um, already set up a clinic up in his practice up in Brookline. And I reached out to him when I saw quickly that um, early on that there was a deficit in the vaccines. And he just gave me a number to call the DPH. So I called them and they told me what I needed to do. and. There was a lot of paperwork I had to fill out um, and um, this computer um, program. And I honestly pestered them. I called them like four times a day <laughs> and um, they sort of laughed at me at first. But then um, they said, you know what? They looked at my credentials and they said, let's let's give this a try. And um, I think it's because I pestered them. But I actually became quite friendly with um, two of the people at the DPH. They were extremely helpful to me. Um, Amy and Josh to, to name, um, they were, um, vaccine allocation specialists and, um, they became, they became, um, my, my sort of my rock and throughout this process. And the other hard part was once we got it, I had to also secure, um, I had to secure a freezer. So the first thing I d did was find a freezer, which was no easy task. And I purchased that with my own money. And I still have that in case, um, you know, we need to do more things in the future. I will always have that. And um, I'm happy to lend it to the Board of Health or the Kingston Fire Department or whoever needs it if we're not able to run more clinics if someone else needs it because um, I'd like to see it used. Yeah, that's great. It's wonderful you saw a need and you just selflessly went to find a solution for that need. And I find that fascinating. I also find what was really fascinating is all the volunteers that you had 
I was able to volunteer a couple of times, but you, you had so many volunteers. How, how did you get all of them? Social media, um, really, you know, word of mouth. Um, I've been practicing for 20 years and I know a lot of nurses and a lot of people in the medical field and word got around quickly. And um, it was interesting because we had people all the way up from Boston come down and volunteer just because they wanted the experience. And um, a lot of the nurses, um, most of my volunteers for medical providers were nurses and they, they would work during the week and still come on their days off. And, and many of them would actually come every single weekend. Um, one nurse, Carol Inglis, actually did every single clinic with me. Um, and my nurse practitioner, Chelsea, that works with me did almost every single clinic also. Um, they, they were quite amazing. And, and we had upwards of 25 to total 40 volunteers every single clinic. And um, it, it, was, it was quite amazing. And what we did was we had a sign up genius on our website and um, we actually had people lined up to uh, volunteer. We had more volunteers than we needed. Uh, we had to turn people away. Um, so we were quite lucky about that, but it, it did get tough towards the end because you could tell um, as the weather got nicer, mm. not as many people wanted to volunteer. Um, I actually called you one day in a panic because we were short and you came out and helped us. Um, and, and that was amazing. And we had people like that that were willing to drop whatever they were doing and volunteer. And uh, we even had one nurse who came to get her vaccine and she saw that we were short because we had a couple of nurses not show up and she took off, she had a high heels on and, and uh, she put on a pair of extra shoes I had in my office and uh, took off her coat and uh, started vaccinating with us. So um, those kind of people um, were amazing during this whole endeavor. I did meet so many amazing nurses while I was there and so many amazing volunteers. And everyone was so thankful when they came in. And I have to say it was so well organized. Um, and I loved that the people that weren't able to come in, you would go right out to their cars. And they all felt, they all felt so good when they left. I mean, there were tears of joy when I was there too. So that must really make you feel well. Um, I know that I'm a busy mom and you're a mom of two and you're super busy, and I know that we couldn't do it without our amazing partners. So tell us about your amazing husband. Um, Matt was a huge part of this. Um, he actually put the most time into it. Um, in the beginning, we had um, we were actually interviewed by Fox News, and the reporter and I were talking, and he mentioned um, how a lot of the seniors are having a difficult time manipulating the website um, so in, in, in order to book. So we had been working on a computer-based booking system and, and we scratched that and decided to do a hybrid of paper so that we can get our seniors and make it more feasible. And um, uh, Mark, who I think you're gonna interview later, Douglas of the Kingston Fire Department was a huge uh, help with us, worked very well with us to help us get supplies and, and do reverse 911 calls to get these people in. Um, Matt was instrumental in getting the logistics part set up um, because the computer system that the government uses was very complex and time consuming and we didn't have time to deal with that. So we built our own um, and Matt built that and he also helped. He would train every single time we had a clinic, he would train all the non-medical personnel and then I would train all the medical personnel to make sure things were done properly because the government has very specific guidelines of how they want everything done. Um, he also would communicate with Mark um, and some of his other um, firefighters um, who were coming um, to help us get the homebound done. And, and so just all the logistic works uh, was Matt. And then on top of, um, we've, we got thousands and thousands of emails and phone calls every single day. Um, he, and my, actually my staff would help field those. So. Um, it definitely impacted my business. I, I didn't realize how much work it was going to be, and I'm glad we did it. But um, a lot of the elderly were very, very scared and frightened. And um, so Matt was there. He would call them um, and talk with them. And, and um, one quick story was we had um, a woman who had her first vaccine, and um, she passed. And her, her dying words basically to her daughter was that she wanted to see her grandson vaccinated. And so the, um, she called Matt and Matt talked to her and I actually saw Matt cry because um, she was on the way from her funeral and we were able to get her son in and get him vaccinated. And, and um, that was quite an impactful um, thing. And, and um, because Matt um, had the extra time to help do all this, 
Um, a lot of people got the personal touch because they got personal phone calls. He answered every single email. Um, it took a long time to do it all. Um, literally, we worked night and day, um, as did many people that helped us um, to get this done. But Matt was a huge part of that. Well, the both of you together are definitely a dynamo duo. I mean, you did amazing work. And we're so grateful in the community that you did this for all of us. Um, I, before we leave, though, I do want to congratulate you on being you. nominated for an unsung heroine by the Massachusetts Commonwealth of Women. So congratulations on that. It's well-deserved. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. I, when you, I got your message, it made me cry. I certainly didn't do it expecting anything. That's not why I did it. And um, it feels really, really good. And um, a quick another thing is um, there was two people I know from town that we got in as last minute doses that were recently diagnosed with cancer. And their doctor said that they wouldn't have um, been able to get their treatments timely if they weren't vaccinated. So um, again, it, it's, it, I have such a huge amount of thanks for all the volunteers and, and for Mark's help um, with running these clinics. And um, we are going to stay in touch with the Department of Public Health and with Mark um, when we the booster situation um, happens, if there's a need, because um, we need to be able to be quick about this and get in and get our um, vulnerable population in because it, it, they, they don't do well going to large venues. No. Jeez. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dawn, and thank you for all that you've done in helping the residents of our district and the surrounding communities in getting your vaccines during a time when it was so difficult to find an appointment. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kathy. We will be right back with our next guest. Welcome back, everyone. My next guest is Mark Douglas. Mark is Chief of the Fire Department in Kingston. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, happy to be with you. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you. So it has been, as we know, I mean, the descriptive of the last year, there's so many things we could say about it. But tell me, what have been the biggest challenges during this pandemic for you as, as the Chief of the Fire Department in Kingston? The, the first and, and biggest challenge for us was keeping our employees safe, keeping the firefighters, the paramedics, EMTs, all safe um, and free from getting COVID. Uh, the, the situation was fluid to say the least. There's been a lot of conversation about could we have handled it better or worse or, or whatever the case may be. But we set the first priority is keeping our, our personnel safe because we certainly wouldn't have been able to provide any quality level of service um, without keeping those people safe. And we were very successful. We did that up until the point that we were vaccinated and, and even post-vaccination uh, of the 25 or so people I have here, no one um, suffered from COVID. No one came down with the disease. So I think we were very successful in accomplishing that. You definitely were very successful because I've heard other stories, you know, throughout the Commonwealth of a lot of departments that had eight or more that contracted COVID. So Kingston was um, did the right thing. Everybody kept safe and you didn't have any incidences of COVID. So we just talked to Don Naylor and I know that you know Don Naylor from the Skin Esteem Spa. So can you just tell us a little bit how that came about, that you came about helping her um, on Saturdays and how you felt about that? Well, it's kind of funny. Um, I've, I feel like I've known Don forever now. I can't even remember back when we met, um, we've, we talked so much between Don and Matt and myself um, to help organize the EMS support for the clinics. Um, we also worked with her and, and some CARES Act funding to get the handouts, uh, the paperwork that everybody got on, um, on the Saturdays and even Sundays sometimes when they would go there. The original phone call, again, I can't even really remember, but I know um, I was super impressed with Dawn, uh, and you can't help but be super impressed with Dawn. She's an extremely intelligent woman, and she she expressed um, to me some of the experiences she had had in the hospital setting, and it was really moving in some ways because she ex would talk about um, the patients patients excuse me that she had had, and the challenges that their family faced being unable to visit and and their medical conditions and so forth. So we, um, we recognized, and there was a lot of guidance out there at the time that the clinics as they began uh, needed EMS support. There was the chance of people having reactions 
to the vaccine. Um, there was much more of a chance discussed back then than actually transpired. We had very few incidents um, of any type of vaccine reaction at the clinic. Most of it was uh, unfortunately, some trip and falls and some lightheadedness and some things of that nature. So as time moved forward, we talked fairly frequently. We helped them with staffing for EMS support. Uh, we helped them with some paperwork, some support in any way we could. Um, and I think it was, as everybody agrees, it was an incredibly successful venture for everybody. It was incredibly successful. And the couple times that I volunteered, just the enthusiasm and the gratefulness of the residents and the, the throughout the whole South Shore, actually, I, there were people there from Boston and the Cape, and they were just so grateful to be able to get their vaccine. Um, and when I was there, your um, department was there as well. Um, I think I was with Dave Currier and John Bartlett, maybe. And they were just so wonderful to everybody in their cars and making sure that everybody was safe after their vaccine. So you have a great department, Mark. You, you've run a, a great show there. Um, so on that, I, I've known you for a long time, but why don't you tell our viewers, like what got you into being a firefighter and then now the chief? Uh, it I have no idea. Back when I was about, I don't know, five, six, seven years old, something sparked an interest and um, it stayed with me. Uh, when I was 19, I was appointed as a dispatcher, uh, a call firefighter shortly after, right around then. And then when I was 20, I was hired um, as a full-time firefighter EMT. I became an EMT intermediate, then an advanced um, I was promoted to captain in 94, deputy in 06, and dropped into this chair about four and a half years ago, um, quite unexpectedly, uh, but it's been a really super rewarding career. You know, I, I'm not sure how to express this very well, um, but things like the clinic uh, are the things that make this so rewarding. Um, if I go back the 37 years or so that I've been doing this, there's an awful lot of people that are, are better off because of the staff we have here and what they do and how well they do it. Um, and, I, and I think that the clinics show that, the enthusiasm that they have for what they do and getting out there on those Saturdays and Sundays and really making a difference um, for them is, is huge. For me, it's huge. Um, and it makes this, all the stresses and everything that goes along with these jobs worth it, frankly. I can understand that. I can definitely understand that. So throughout your career, what has been the most challenging? Has it been this pandemic or have there been other years that you found more challenging? Oh, town politics is, is well, well above all of the challenges that we face on the job. <laughs> Interacting with government, I think is, is always gonna be challenging because there's such a change um, to every time you have a committee change and that committee is responsible for for funding, it, it involves an enormous level of re-education. Um, not that anyone is ignorant, stupid or anything and can be described it at all in that way. It's simply, uh, you have people come into the, the mix, the fold, uh, however you wanna describe it, that are not educated um, in the depth of, of government and the departments, um, us or the other department services that they provide. So there's a tremendous amount of education that goes on there. Um, most of, within our, our department or within our, our service, if you will, uh, most are well-schooled um, and well-educated in what we all do and we understand it. And we have to spend, as I said, a great deal of time educating others um, in that area. But again, as a department, um, I feel, and I think the members will agree, uh, very well supported by the public, um, by the political administration or environment. We feel the same way, uh, very well supported. And that makes a, a big difference to the firefighters, to, to all of the staff, um, that they actually feel as if they're respected and um, appreciated, frankly. Well, I think that we all want to feel respected and appreciated, and, and that's an important thing. And I know that your department does feel that way, and that's from your leadership. So that's a, a great testament to you, Mark. But I want to thank you today. For, I know that you had to change things around to be on my first show, and I really appreciate that. Um, but I want to thank you, Mark, for joining us today in discussing the role. 
your role in the department and the vaccine. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me today, Kath. It's always a pleasure. We'll be right back with the State House Minute. While Profiles is dedicated to sharing stories from the 12th Plymouth District, I also like to keep my constituents informed of the happenings up at the State House, which is why I will be ending each of my shows with a State House Minute. The Massachusetts House of Representatives recently finished up our fiscal year 2022 budget. This budget was a resounding success for the people of the 12th Plymouth District and the entire Commonwealth. We increased local aid to cities and towns as well as our schools, which keeps Massachusetts on track to fully fund the Student Opportunity Act, which was passed last session and will assist schools across the Commonwealth to meet our students' needs. This budget also addresses many challenges families across Massachusetts have faced for years. Issues such as housing shortages, food insecurity, and the need for more adequate and affordable childcare. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the desperate need to address these issues, and I was proud to support a budget that does just that. From here, the budget will go to the Senate for amendments and debate. The House and the Senate will get together in a conference committee to rectify differences in the two budgets and will send a final version to be signed by the governor. To follow the budget process, go to malegislature.com dot gov forward slash budget forward slash budget. This section on the state website gives residents a step by step explanation of the process. I would like to thank both of my guests for joining us to discuss the important work that went into setting up the vaccination clinic at the Skin Esteem Meds Bar in Kingston. This has been an incredibly difficult year, but because of people like Don and Mark, we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you for watching the first episode of Profiles. I hope you'll join us next month.